let's let's dive a little bit more into your into the meat of your book and kind of the kind of aspects how weather influences military operations and the but i have to confess the early war like the first year is something i'm not as familiar with especially when it comes to the military side so that part was really fascinating to me to kind of go through some of that material again and kind of refresh my memory and especially the chapter on west virginia really caught my eye and you have Lee and Stonewall Jackson operating here and kind of trying to kind of figure out how can we maintain this region, um, advances from including McClellan coming into the region. And obviously the weather had a huge impact on operations, but it felt a little bit like kind of this larger question that sometimes arises, how did this, the Confederacy survive that first year considering how how badly it was going, especially in this region, for two commanders that today a lot of people celebrate as these heroic, undefeatable figures. It's it's funny. I was I was talking about that with my civil war class just the other day. I think we forget how close the Confederacy came to losing the war in 1862. They were losing everywhere except in Virginia. Hmm. So I mean, it is sort of a miracle that they survived in some ways. Well, perhaps miracle is not the word. It's interesting that they survived. Um, I think part of it was that they learned how to adapt and survive. And that often took place at an individual level or at a regimental level. I think it's pretty safe to argue that during the first winter of the war, Confederate soldiers were able to build better shelters and get through the winter. Confederates invariably will build log cabins when they have the chance. When they have enough wood and time and axes, they will build cabins. Um, McClellan's army, for political reasons, never officially went into winter quarters. That would have been politically suicidal for McClellan. So from the beginning, the federal soldiers are riding out that winter in tents or they're building these hybrid structures which have log walls or canvas tops, which actually becomes the federal standard. They learn how to adapt, which helps. Um, to an extent, I think the fact that they are, they're used to a particular environment helps them, although not as much as you might think. It, it, it seems like soldiers from the Deep South had as much trouble with Virginia as federal soldiers did, just for different reasons, but they, they thought it's hard to be cold. I think that makes a difference. Uh, the Confederacy had a really, well, I won't say an ally, I almost said an important ally, sometimes an ally, sometimes not. But if we go back to that notion of the blue, the gray, and the weather, with the exception of Union troops from parts of Maryland, Delaware, a little bit of New Jersey, and that area right around Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. They had never seen soil, like the soil they encountered in the Confederacy. Um, more so in the flatlands than in West Virginia, but that red clay, ultisol that we all complain about when we live down here, uh, really does almost define the Confederacy on a map. And what was unique about that soil is that, as Union soldiers quickly discovered, it was, the word they used, bottomless. Um, most soil in the north, most soil in the mountains, um, you'll sink so far, but then you'll come to a solid layer. But because red clay is so porous and doesn't have much uh, vegetative growth in it left, um, by the time you get to that hard strata, you're already in over your head. As far as the soldier was concerned, it was bottomless. And that soil, until they learned how to deal with it, really did slow down federal advances and allowed the Confederacy, in part, to survive. I, I used to read, you know, 20 years ago, I used to read accounts of horses being buried up to their ears. And I thought, surely that's just hyperbole. I don't think it is anymore. I think it's absolutely true because that's how that red clay soil 
work. So I think that's actually a factor as well. Um, you know, there are other reasons, but I think in, in terms of environment, um, the soil helped them that winter and they were able to adapt and survive. Um, I guess the final thing I would mention is, is one that's kind of controversial because meteorologists themselves will disagree on what exactly was happening. But the weather that first winter was, was very, very unusual. I mean, it does seem to be a factor related to um, what technically is called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, we hear our, our weather folks on TV all the time talking about El Nino at one extreme, or at the other extreme is something called a La Nina year. And both of those, when we reach extremes, affects weather in the country differently. So we get brush fires or we get mudslides in California. Well, those things also affect the Gulf states. They affect the east. Mm -hmm. And that was clearly active. Um, starting around December 1861 and into 62. There are some scholars who argue that there's an extended La Nina through the war. There are other scholars who, who think that um, you enter an El Nino phase in 1862. Yeah. People who know more about this than I do can continue to argue about it and will. It's changed twice since I started writing this book. But the weather was really unusual and in in some ways, as on the peninsula, it did help the Confederacy. There's also a, a comparable but lesser known system out in the Atlantic called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which runs from a low pressure system near Iceland to a high pressure system near uh, the Azores, and it fluctuates from year to year, and it seems to have been active as well in 1862. So if you, you put those two things together and just add typical climate and how climate will change, individual weather data will change from day to day. Um, I think ultimately weather helps the Union win the war, but there are moments when it helps extend the war, helps keep the Confederacy alive, and that winter is one of those moments. Mm -hmm.